Cool. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm a software engineer in the Facebook London office. I've been there for almost four years now. Spent the first three working on our testing infrastructure, basically the system that kicks in once an engineer sends a pull request and figures out uh, what are they breaking. Usually break stuff, unfortunately. Um, that's mostly written in Python um, and a bit of React for the UI. Uh, more recently, I moved to, to the integrity space, so now I'm trying to prevent uh, bad actors from uh, causing harm of the platform. Um, think, uh, you can think of this like um, buying political ads in countries you're not supposed to, the US, for example, or um, misrepresenting yourself, so creating an account with uh, Bill Gates as the name and then the picture of Bill Gates and trying to make people think you're Bill Gates. Um, a bit less Python, but still, because of our scale, um, think, for example, it's one billion photos uploaded each week on Facebook. Uh, everything needs to be automated. We can rely on human reviews for like a very small uh, percentage of all our traffic. So automation is still like mostly built uh, in Python and some parts in C++ when you need, really need, uh, need performance. Um, if you want to chat afterwards about something that's not Python or tech, um, topics I really enjoy are aviation. I'm a huge Av geek, thanks to Facebook, I managed to do quite a bit of flying, so I'm often not, not in London. Uh, and another topic I really like are point, points and miles. If you have any spreadsheet tracking all your redemption, we can compare notes. Okay, so the talk for today is why should you uh, care about types? The agenda is, first of all, why is typing important uh, in modern Python code bases? Then I'll give a brief intro about what typing looks like these days. Um, this is obviously not 100% of features available, but it's more of like the least, uh, the smallest number of features that you need to be productive with, uh, with typing. Uh, then I'll cover uh, types in the real world. How do you um, start typing a new project? And then the most common these days in the industry, how do you add types to an existing large, uh, large project? And last but not least, uh, lessons learned. The first uh, three chapters are more about why is typing great and why should you use it. The fourth one is like, uh, I want to include at least some of the bits that are still uh, missing in the whole ecosystem and how to get around them until they get fixed. Okay, so let's address the questions from the title first. Why should you care about, uh, about types? I mean, one could say that Python has been running fine without any uh, typing information for a really long time. So why do we suddenly need to turn into Java or another statically typed language? Well, that's all true. I think uh, two key aspects that changed over the, the last decade is um, the amount of people writing Python code and the size of uh, single projects in Python. So if you think like how Python started, it was like, first of all, a uh, scripting language for um, sysops and automation. Um, then Django, uh, Flask, and Pyramid came around, so suddenly Python became a reasonable alter alternative to PHP. Uh, the next step function was with uh, uh, NumPy, Pandas, and all the mathematic utilities, so Python suddenly became the tool of choice for all data scientists and data engineers. And then even uh, on top of that, uh, ML libraries like scikit-learns were built that made machine learning more accessible than ever before. So the point I want to make with, with this is that the popularity of Python has grown uh, really massively over the last decade. So the amount of people reading Python code has also gone up with that. So it's more important than ever that we uphold like, the key values of why Python is so great, which is mostly kind of like it's easy to write and easy to read. When I teach the uh, Python 101 class at Facebook for New Engineers, one of the things I really stress out is like, uh, they write code once, but then that code will be read by other engineers at least five to 10 times just to review the pull request. So we should be optimizing for the read case, not for the write case, and that's why Python is so great. The, the second point was about the growing size of uh, Python code bases. Like take Instagram, for example, uh, largest jungle app in the world, uh, millions and millions of lines of code. 
So adding type annotations there is not so much about the type safety of the type checker and like more integration testing. It's just about making engineers more productive because it's easier to read, um, to read the code. So let me try to illustrate that on, uh, on an example. Um, imagine you've started working at uh, a new company and you get assigned um, a ramp up task to improve logging of some job scheduling uh, code. Uh, the engineer that prepared the task uh, points to this snippet as the best place to, to get started. So your task is to just log more attributes for each, uh, each job submission. So the first thing you need to figure out is like what this uh, jobs argument actually is. So how can you do that? Well, first of all, you can just look at the code around it. So jobs obviously needs to be some kind of iterable since there's a for loop over it. And then from the code, we know that each job has a name and a meta attribute that in turn knows about the priority of each job. So um, one way of finding the code for uh, what the job type is would be to actually grab for it, right? We know how to use Unix tooling. It's easy to search for a class called job. The problem in large code bases is that that will yield thousands of results. Um, if it's too small, that's over a thousand, and that's a real example from uh, the Facebook backend repo from a uh, few months ago. So just grabbing for things usually does not yield good results. Um, another problem with it is that, uh, oh, sorry. So another way of finding how jobs uh, look like is to look for how they are constructed. So if you know where the submit function uh, is called, you can go from there and then figure out how the jobs are, are constructed. Um, one of the problems there is that you do not know if it's called as uh, module name dot submit or it's used the more common like from uh, scheduler input submit. So again, you're going to have to search the code base for both. Uh, it's quite time consuming, but it's doable. If you actually manage to find uh, a good example of the submit function being called, then again, like the argument construction may not be super trivial. Again, you might need in a large code base to do like 10 jumps away until you figure out exactly how the objects are, are created. So what else, what else can we try? Um, one option is to expect, uh, inspect types at runtime. So we can use the uh, print function to print the, the type of, of each job at runtime, and we can also use the uh, dir built-in function to actually uh, scan for all the attributes of, uh, of the job. And this kind of solves the problem of like figuring out what other things we could log with, uh, with every job. Um, the problem with it, though, it's quite clunky. Every time you need to figure out what the type of something is, you need to put in instrumentation, you need to restart your server, you need to make sure that the request that you send to the server will trigger that specific part of the code, which in large code bases honestly can be more tricky than you'd, uh, than you'd imagine. And another problematic aspect with this is that the experience of an engineer does not really play a role. So you can be a super senior or a junior just out of university, those sprints will work exactly the same. So it's hard even like with experience to be better, uh, to be better at this. So there has to be a better way, right? And this is where typing uh, comes into play. So typing solves the issue of making it obvious uh, at first glance what the input and output pairs of, uh, of a function are. The productivity win here is, uh, is pretty high because when you want to inspect uh, the type of something, you can usually just click through. If you're using a, a modern IDE like PyCharm or um, VS Code, usually just come and click on the argument type will uh, immediately bring you to the definition of, of that class, which compared to all other options we looked at, it's way faster. So having more uh, readable code actually also helps massively uh, to onboard new engineers. And the next thing I want to talk about is uh, how this drastically helped me scale my team at Facebook while I was still um, working on, on testing in front. All our code was in Python. So here there's one specific that uh, Facebook has bootcamp. So when you're hired for a company, you're not hired for a team, you're hired for an office. So say you join the New York office, and then you're going to have 
uh, about six weeks to figure out which team you want to join. So basically, all teams compete for talent to try to convince engineers to join them. So every uh, new engineer takes a few tasks from teams they like and then figure out like, which one they like best and then join the team. Uh, you can think of this uh, as having tons of open source projects that you can, can pick from and you have three weeks to explore them and maybe send a few, send a few pull requests and at the end you need to decide kind of like which one you like best and want to continue contributing long term. So it turns out that when engineers are productive, they are way more likely to join your team uh, because people like getting stuff done from, from day one. And if they have type information about your code, uh, the barrier of entry for starting doing something useful is actually much lower than if the code is without types, uh, especially on huge code bases as our own. Um, and all our backend is monorepo, so we can imagine how big it is. And as I said, this applies to, to open source uh, pretty well. Uh, in my opinion, the three key concepts to like, have an open source project grow quickly are uh, good getting started documentation, uh, typed code that's easy to, easy to understand and easy to get started by sending a pull request, and automated testing uh, in CI. If you have those three key components in place, I've seen quite a few projects just like very organically getting uh, new contributors, while other projects that are more complex to get started usually need to rely on getting people up to speed in sprints, which is also a fair strategy. Okay, the next question I want to address is um, are Python types Pythonic? When other engineers uh, at Facebook here are um, very passionate about having fully typed Python code bases, um, the usual reaction is something along the line on ice, Python's turning into Java, uh, and it's going to have the same fate as Java. So let's try to answer this next. Are Python types Pythonic? I think the answer is yes. And a good strategy to figure out if something's Pythonic is to look at the Zen of Python, which you get to by importing this. I think in this case, there are um, three key points that support uh, typing, which is um, explicit is better than implicit, readability counts, and in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. Especially the last one, I think, like, is very strongly uh, for typing, because if the type of something was obvious when you wrote the code, ideally, if you go back after a week and read the code again, it should be obvious still. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen things like ID or transaction ID or user ID, and I had no idea if it was a string or an integer because we do not enforce it across the code base. So usually you have to start your server and figure out like how, um, in a production example, what type it is, which is super slow. Um, if this is not enough, um, also Guido said so before he retired from being the benevolent di dictator for life, so you can take his word for it as well. Um, the second question is, is Python turning into Java or C++ or any other statically typed language? And the answer here is definitely no. Um, it's definitely uh, inspired by other languages, and I guess we've taken the best bits and pieces from all other people that made mis mistakes before us and learned from them. In Python, typing is still uh, very much optional. You can use it, you cannot use it, you can use it partially, you can use it where you think it's useful. So it's completely up to the developer and the team to figure out how they want to use it. Um, another key aspect is that uh, typing has no impact at runtime, ideally. Um, there is a cost you pay for importing the typing module, but you pay that only at server startup time. So hopefully it's not, uh, it's not an issue for the vast majority of projects. And last but not least, type errors can be ignored, which is usually not the case in any other statically typed language. So in C++, if you run GCC to compile your code, if there's an error, there's no way of silencing that error. We need to fix it and, and recompile. In Python, that's, uh, that's not the case. OK, so let's look at typing 101. The set of features you need to know to get started with, uh, with typing. So as everything in Python, it's good to know like, how, it got, uh, how it got started. And in this case, there are two PEPs that are um, of relevance. The first one is PEP 3107, all the way back from 2006. 
that defined the syntax for annotating uh, functions, but did not um, define that that needs to be typing. So anything, any use for functional annotation could be still uh, used today. Then uh, the PEP that you are most familiar with, if you used typing before, is uh, PEP 404 called Type Hints from 2014. Um, the authors are really well-known people, so Guido himself, um, Yuka, which is the author of MyPy, the first Python type checker, and Lukas Langa, which used to be a colleague of mine in the London office and is now responsible for the release of 3.8 and 3.9. Um, so type hints basically give the blueprint of how to make typing work in Python, how to make the semantics work, and how to allow people to build type checkers. So MyPy, while being like the most commonly used type checker, uh, it's not the Python type checker, it's just one of the Python type checkers. And in the spirit of the previous PEP, so 3107, uh, if you find a new use case for functional annotations, you're still very free to use them. Um, so if you have a great idea on how to exploit them, it's still compatible with PEP 404, um, 484 for, for typings. Okay, so let's look at what needs to be, to be annotated. Uh, in this case, we have uh, my print function that takes a message and just uh, prints it with, with some formatting, and a square that has an init function that probably takes the, the length of the size. So, if you look at how the type version of this code looks like, it's like pretty close to what uh, to I just described. So we have a myprint function that takes a message, which is a string, and returns none, since there's no explicit return statement. And the init method of the square accepts an int. Could have been a float as well. And uh, by definition, all init uh, functions have to return uh, none. Okay. So what else needs to be annotated? In some cases, uh, variables. So this is not the case as in like other uh, static type language with every single variable needs to start with a type, so like int counter equals zero. So in this case, uh, all type checkers are smart enough to figure out from the context uh, what the type of something is. When they usually uh, need help is when you have an empty collection initialized somewhere and then you fill it uh, up elsewhere. So the type checker is not like smart enough to figure out all the possible code paths and figure out what the type of a dictionary is. So in those cases, when you initialize the dictionary, you need to tell the type checker, okay, this is going to be a dictionary with string uh, keys and integer values. Uh, this syntax with uh, the colon after the variable name works only in 3.6 and up. So if you're still using Python 3.5 or lower, you can use the comment syntax. As far as the type checkers um, are concerned, this is exactly the same. It's just a, a slightly older version of it. Okay, next let's look at collections. So here we have a function that needs to compute the active users per country of our service, for example. So the first argument is a list of users where uh, every element of the list is a tuple that has an integer and a string. The integer represents the user ID and the string represents the name of the country where this user is based. The second argument is uh, a set of uh, user ID for our test users, because we probably don't want to be reporting test users in our stats. And the return type was, as I was saying, the um, count per country. So the key of the dictionary is the name of the country, and then the value is the number of users in that specific country. And that kind of covers uh, all basic collections you'd be using day to day in Python. So uh, list sets, dictionary, and, and tuples usually don't need much more than that to be very productive with typing. Next, let's, let's look at unions. Uh, unions uh, allow you to say that at runtime, something is going to be either type A or type B. So in this case, I have an example of a function that fetches uh, something from a database given a um, numeric ID. Say, for example, in MySQL, the uh, ID of the row that we're fetching from. 
So since we don't know uh, if uh, the numeric ID is going to be for a user or a page in a simplified Facebook example, we basically need to tell the function that the return type is going to be either a user uh, or a page. So if I uh, asked for my own uh, ID, I'd get back a user. And if I asked for the ID of the PyCon ZA Facebook page, I would get back, uh, back a page. Um, if you don't trust me on the numbers, you can actually try them yourself. If you go on to facebook.com slash and you put this number, it actually will land you on, on the correct page. OK, but what happens if I look for an ID that's not there? Say, like, minus 1 probably is not a valid uh, row number. So in this case, we can just return none. So we can amend our function signature to be a union of user, page, and, uh, and none. Uh, this is a super common uh, construct. There's actually a slightly cleaner way of doing it, which is called uh, optional. Uh, as far as the type checker is concerned, a union with none or an optional are exactly the, the same thing. But semantically, it's slightly better because it explains better like what the function does, which is if I find an ID, I return that object, which can be a user or a page. Otherwise, I return none if I, find, if I don't find anything. OK, the last key concept I want to try to explain are type vars. Um, the theory behind them is slightly convoluted, so let's, let me start from an example again. Uh, in this case, we have, super simple, a base class and a derived class that uh, extends a base class. And then we have a fluctuate function that takes the type of a class and returns the, an instance of, uh, of that of that same class. So as things are typed currently, so like we type base class and returning base class, the type checker would think that regardless of if we pass in base class or derived class to the factory, the actual uh, output type would always be base class, which works fine enough. It's not wrong, but we actually do lose uh, information. It's better to be as specific as possible with, uh, with typing. So we, what we would actually want to get is for when we call the factory over a derived class, let the type checker know that that's an instance of the derived class, not of the base class. And the system to make this possible are type vars. Um, you can think of type vars as kind of like placeholder um, for typing information, that once the um, input is known, then the output is definitely of type, uh, of type T. So in this case, we define a new type var. Uh, the first argument is the name of the type var, which needs to match the variable name. That's an implementation detail. And then we bound this type var to the base class, which basically uh, means we are take t now can represent anything that's a base class or a derived um, class from, from base class. So now that the factory uses the type var rather than a hard-coded type, it actually would correctly uh, identify calling the factory over the derived class as having the derived type. OK. Uh, the next important bit is the, the type checker. So if you look at the super simple example, we import the math module and we ask the square root of 100, both as an integer and, and a string, we expect, uh, what is it, line 3 to write type error, because obviously you cannot ask the square root over a string. So here I'm using MyPy, since it's the most uh, common type checker these days. So just run uh, MyPy, and you point it to your Python file. And sure enough, MyPy is going to say that that does not work, because SQRT expects a uh, float. The conversion from integer to floats happen, happens automatically. I also want to mention uh, Pyre as an alternative to MyPy for type checking. Uh, as far as the user is concerned, um, in terms of like the errors reported and how it looks and feels, it's very, very similar because they're all based on the same pep spec. Uh, the main uh, advantage of Pyre is it's much, much faster on large code bases. It was uh, developed by a team at Instagram because MyPy was just getting too slow for the size of the whole Django repo. So when it launched uh, about two years ago, uh, MyPy took about five minutes to run on the full Instagram code base. 
uh, Pyre took 45 seconds, which is almost an order of magnitude uh, faster. So for smaller code bases, the difference will not be as great, but for medium to large size, the difference can, can be quite, uh, quite large. And another selling point for Pyre is that it was designed from day one to support uh, incremental uh, typing. So basically, if you just add a new line somewhere and you, and you save the file, uh, Pyre knows there's no need to retype check the whole application and spend one minute on that. Uh, MyPy is getting de uh, that features as well, but they're still under, under development like Pyre, so it's a pretty strong selling point if you have a large code base. Okay, so let's uh, next look at how do you uh, start using types in, uh, in the real world. Uh, first, let's look at the easy bit, which is for, for new projects. And honestly, here the recipe is pretty simple. Um, we just ship 100% typed Python code from day one. You enable the type checker in CI because you do not want all that good work to go to waste. So first of all, you want to uh, prevent from type errors from being introduced in the code base, but then you also want to make sure that if the code base was 100% typed, it stays, uh, stays that way. Um, you can think of this similar, uh, in a similar fashion as preventing test rot. So if you had 100% test coverage, there are ways in uh, continuous integration to make sure that the test coverage does not go down. Um, the same can be done for, for typing. And that's really it. Uh, once you have your setup in continuous integration, um, your work is mostly done and automation will police everything, everything for you. Let's look now at the hard part, existing slash large projects, which are honestly the more common uh, case in the industry. So a key concept for how to start typing large projects is to first understand how gradual, gradual typing work. So again, let's start from an example. So we're gonna have uh, two Python files, job.py and utils.py, and job depends on, on utils. And here's the code for them. So utils just has a, a pretty print function that basically accepts a job and prints it nicely formatted as, as JSON. And then job.py is the one responsible for actually creating the job. So if you just glanced over this code, you would probably expect the type error to be raised because we're passing in a string where we accept a job type. Uh, the thing is, this would not cause a type error because of gradual typing. Uh, the create job function is not annotated. It does not have a return type. So the type checker will completely skip the body of that function. This basically allows you uh, to start typing large code bases without uh, paying a huge cost for the first few files. So you can imagine, if you have like 100 Python files and you have one util that all the, all the other 99 depend on, if you started typing something in util, you'd probably get errors in the other 99, which would make starting with typing like really hard. And that's why uh, first you'd only type check util itself, and then util itself against the next file you start, uh, you start typing. So the way for getting this uh, type error to show, to show up is just to add the return type to, to create job. And then sure enough, MyPy would figure out that's not the, the right typing plus then. Okay, so let's go back to the recipe for hard projects. So as I said, the easiest way is to start from um, the common libraries, the utils.py of your project because they require the least um, cognitive overload to understand what's going on. Uh, usually they, they depend only on themselves or in the standard library, which is reasonably typed. So it should not be a huge amount of work to figure out like how the utilities work and what are the input-output uh, pairs. After that, the same as for the easy bit, we try to run the type checker, make sure everything's fine and then we turn on the type checker in CI, because even if you manage to get only, say, 2% of the code base typed, uh, it's still very much worth to make the 2% two, the two stick and make sure no one else uh, on your team regresses it. And the fourth point is to ask people to add types to new code, which 
can be tricky. Um, this depends quite a bit on the setup of your team. Um, at least in my cases so far, uh, code quality and investments in code quality were always well seen. So anything that would improve test coverage or readability was always very well seen. So as soon as we started uh, using typing on the team, everyone was very eager to start like looking at their old code and see if they could add more, more types. Um, it's also very important for leadership, though, to uh, encourage this type of work, because otherwise it's hard to, to justify it, even if it's like the investment is small, uh, working on this set and shipping a new feature, for example. And the last, the last trick is to use uh, monkey type, which I'm going to cover next. So monkey type is a utility also developed by Instagram when they figured out that for huge code bases, you can rely on engineers to some extent, but just adding type annotations everywhere, it's a pretty tedious job, like just saying, like, this, this ID is an integer, this ID is a string. So they basically designed a system that can collect types uh, at runtime and log them. Uh, then the system takes all these logs, aggregates them, uh, figures out what the signature of a function should be, and can also apply it back uh, to the code itself. And this can be uh, pretty good to get like, at least the easy part of typing out of the way. I've seen pretty large projects get from 0% uh, type to 20 to 30% uh, within one day by using, uh, by using monkey type. Uh, what monkey type uh, generates for you are stubs. Um, these are basically files with the PyYI extension uh, that contain valid uh, Python code, but instead of having the body of each function, they only have the signature, and they have module-level uh, variable as well. So in this case, I'm showing the example of the stub from uh, the math module of the standard library. So as you would expect, uh, pi is typed as a float, so 3.14 and, uh, and so on. So how do you use monkey type? As everything Python, you have to pip install it. Then you use the monkey type run wrapper to basically start your application. Uh, by default, this will track types of all function calls and generate uh, a SQLite database in the local directory. And then uh, you can ask monkey type to generate the stub for a specific module based on all the logs collected. So in the examples I was showing earlier with pretty print, uh, monkey type would actually say that uh, the job was a string since it was the only example it saw in, uh, in production. And this also shows kind of like one of the hidden benefits of, uh, of monkey type. In some cases, uh, some of the generated types can be really unexpected, and I've found quite a few bugs in our code base just through, like relying on this, figuring out that something we expect not to be a union is actually a union, or the other way around uh, as well. Uh, another added benefit is that if my pi cannot find um, the type definition for one of your functions, it's usually a very good indication that's actually not used. So it's that code that you could remove and reduce complexity. And the last steps for a monkey type is just to apply back um, the generated stubs uh, to the actual code. Uh, you can either keep the type information in line or in the, into the PyYI files. That's a basically a decision done per project. Um, usually, I prefer uh, inline types for new projects, and for existing ones, it's sometimes easier to keep them, keep them separate in another repo. Um, another thing to note here, though, is that this, unfortunately, cannot be done for 100% of production traffic. Uh, inspecting all function calls is, as you can imagine, very expensive. Um, so the solution that Instagram did uh, for this was to basically subsample randomly 1% of incoming production traffic and then run them through this special tier of servers that had uh, type collection on. Uh, that did not degrade performance too much and still got very realistic traffic to, to gather the, the typing information. Okay, and the last section is about uh, lessons learned over the last three years of been using Python typing quite extensively. The, the first one I want to cover is duck typing in the new statically typed way. Like, 
where the, where the ducks end up going. Uh, I guess you all know the famous, if it looks like a duck, uh, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So how do we make that work with statically typed information? At first glance, it does not seem super, super compatible. So here we have a function called duck things that accepts a duck, returns none, and then just calls quack and swim over the duck object. Then let's say we have two examples, um, Pharaoh duck and gecko duck. So both like, look reasonable, they both quack and swim. Um, this is what they look like. Uh, but the type checker would not be too happy with this, obviously, because they do not extend duck directly, although at runtime it would be totally fine, because they can both quack and swim. So how do we reconcile this basically uh, code that's fine at runtime, but the type checker is unhappy with? The solution to that is called um, protocols. It's not yet in the standard typing uh, module, because it's still a tiny bit experimental, so you have to pip install uh, typing extensions. In my experience, though, uh, we've never seen any issues with it uh, in production, so it works perfectly fine and it's ready to be used, uh, to be used today. So with protocols, we can now define a duck that um, quacks and flies, and you see the three dots after the, the function signature. That's the same as, as in stubs. It's basically skipping the body of the, of the function. So with protocols, we basically, instead of expressing uh, a class extending something, we express the looks like uh, attribute. So now that duck thing accept a duck, which is a protocol, anything that looks like a duck will be type checked fine, fine as well. And it's quite interesting that Python supports this now, because duck typing makes uh, Python so fast and easy, and easy to write, uh, but it still kind of like reconciles this of being able to use both um, structural subtyping, which is what you would know from like C++ and Java, so you say like A extends from B implements C, uh, while also supporting uh, behavioral subtyping, which is basically this protocol thing of like, um, an object needs to be able to do something rather than uh, looking at the inheritance of it. Next is the, the type shed, which caused me quite a few headaches when I started typing our, our code base. So if you end up finding a uh, typing error against a module in the standard library, and you try to look at the types for the standard library, it's actually interesting that the types are not in the code. They're in a separate repo um, called the type shed, which still sits under the Python umbrella on GitHub. But the reason it's done uh, that way is to make the type information be able to evolve much faster and not be bound to the Python release schedule. Um, so that errors can be fixed much, uh, much, much faster. Uh, another nuance point uh, in this story is that the type shed is usually bundled uh, with your type checker. So if you have two different type checkers installed in your, on your machine, they're not necessarily using the same version of the, of the type shed, which can honestly be quite confusing in some cases, especially if you're trying to show that my Py and Pyre uh, catch the, the same things. Uh, the type shed is still very much uh, far from perfect, so if you find a bug, please send a pull request. Um, usually the contributors are super, super responsive, and you can get the thanks from, from Gidok himself. Usually he's the one approving the pull requests there. And what notable modules that still are like a bit behind are multi-threading and, and multi-processing. So if you want to contribute, I would start looking from there. Next we have uh, type ignore. And I mentioned before, this is like the, the weird situation if you come from, a, from C++ where you cannot tell the compiler to shut up and let you compile if there's a type error. In Python, you can actually do that. And not all type errors are necessarily evil, um, partially because we have the system for skipping type errors, partially because the whole ecosystem is still kind of in beta, so there are, are like known issues and things that, that don't, don't work well. I'll have an example, example in a bit. 
So I had this discussion, I feel like about a year and a half um, ago with, with Guido about how should we type um, internals uh, of, specific, of specific modules. And his point was that the type should at least, um, the typing information for the standard library so should almost act as a documentation for it, rather than having every single internal uh, variable type checked uh, correctly. Um, the discussion started from, uh, from this piece of code, which I know is quite a bit to, to look on a slide. But basically, the, I was building a timeout um, to basically stop waiting on, uh, on a queue with async jobs. And there is an implementation detail if uh, the join, op join method is already called on the queue. Even if you raise uh, an exception in that thread, it still does not wake up and is still waiting on the queue to resolve first. So basically, my fix for that was when the timeout fired, uh, use this callback, unblock queue callback, which would basically um, get the lock of the queue and just uh, release the lock so that the queue would yield back control to the main thread and the main thread could uh, process the exception from the timeout. The problem was that the queue module did not have this all tasks done lock uh, type checked correctly, and that's the one I wanted to add in the pull request that I was showing. And Guido was against it. He preferred like just adding this um, to type ignores comment to skip, to skip the, li the lines entirely because he did not feel it was uh, useful to introduce such a like low level implementation detail uh, into the type stubs them themselves. Okay, next let's look at how to handle JSONs in the statically typed word. This is another one that's like very, very tricky. So if we start with these examples and start building our JSON type, we can first look at the, the primitives. So, okay, a JSON primitive is a union of uh, an integer, a float, a string, and a none. In this case, we covered all examples. So next, let's see, numbers has to be a list. So we can define uh, JSON lists as a list of uh, primitives. And then we have objects like um, the uh, y equals true. So in this case, we say, okay, like JSON object is a dictionary with string keys and then a union. The value can be a primitive. If you look at the x case, it can be a JSON list if you look at numbers, but then it can be a nested object if you look at the object case. And this is usually when all type checkers go kaboom. So this case is currently not supported and it's not, not gonna be anytime soon. Um, so unfortunately, there's no uh, reasonable way currently to express um, recursive uh, typing structures. So the best way currently available for uh, type checking JSON is just to define them as dictionaries of strings and any as, as value, which does bring a tiny bit of value in terms of, you know, that's like needs to be a dict and keyed by strings, but otherwise like pretty, pretty low. And it makes hard to reason about uh, JSON code as well. So a better strategy of how to handle JSON in a statically typed world is called uh, named tuple which is a new uh, class in the, in the typing module that allows you to very quickly prototype classes that are immutable and, uh, and type safe. So in this case, we create a blob, which is kind of like the one-to-one -one mirror to our JSON blob. We say, okay, x is an optional float, then we have numbers, which is a list of integers, and we have object, that's a dict um, from string to end. And then we just have to provide uh, a manually created class method to parse the JSON blob and actually create the named tuple version of, this, of the same blob. The advantage of this approach is that we have to do it only once. So basically, as soon as you get the JSON from the wire, you can cast it to a named tuple. And then from there on, you always work with a typed structure, which is easier to understand, easier to read, and also uh, has the benefit of being immutable, so you cannot uh, change things by mistake. Okay, 
uh, that's it. Let me just recap what we learned today. So first of all, um, type plantations are protonic, not just because I say so, but because Guido says so. Um, you should start using them for the readability win, definitely, and get the extra safety uh, and automation from a type checker almost, almost for free. Uh, for new projects, it's pretty easy. Just start from day one, make sure that uh, continuous integration is set up and you're good to go. For the harder part, existing large code bases, uh, thanks to gradual typing, you can start very small and not have a huge investment. You can type two or three files, send it for your team to review, see what they think. And by using monkey type, you can actually bootstrap uh, a large amount of typing information without doing too much work. Um, for our backend services in Python, I've very commonly seen monkey type do a very reasonable job uh, for 20 to 30 percent of typing information based on only like a few hours of production data. And last, avoid using JSON blobs directly because it's code that's usually hard to understand and very often breaks if a key suddenly be becomes unavailable and try to use named tuples instead. All the code, um, all the code snippets from the slides as well as the uh, slides themselves are already on my uh, GitHub if you want to check them out. And that's all I had for today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Luca. Um, I really like that slide transition when you had Guido said so. <laughs> I don't know how you find a, an appropriate thing that's uh, relevant for the benevolent director for life. <laughs> um, a word of warning, the juice on your table isn't juice, it's cordial. I found this out the hard way. Uh, oh. Please take care, for goodness sake. Um, so, uh, it's question time. So we're going to have some people roaming around with mics. So if you have some questions, let's get started. Um, some interesting things that came out of that talk, quite amazing, was, um, I don't know if you heard, but Instagram uses Django for their back end, which is pretty fucking incredible. Uh, sorry, excuse the language. Um, and monkey type looks amazing. I can't wait to actually check that out on GitHub. All right, uh, do we have some floating mics anywhere? All right, I'm gonna just go, go ahead right here. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Sure. It's a great pleasure to know that uh, many, many people understand that typing is very great uh, util to uh, grow up readability in code base and it's great help. This task. Uh, my question is regarding uh, typing dictionaries. Uh, we have heavy ETL application, and uh, we we can we can't uh, um, take overhead to wrap up in name tuple or some class and wrap out uh, on other end. Is there any uh, mm, solutions to? this problem. Maybe my P or Pire can uh, introduce uh, dictionary typing in the future. Um, what we use internally to solve that problem is usually data classes. So we would express our business logic in terms of data classes, which are basically the same as name tuples, but mutable. Uh, and then there are already built-in utilities for converting um, from JSON to data classes and from data classes back to JSON, as well as to Trift, which we use internally for, for RPC. So in general, we, don't, we try to avoid using dictionaries directly unless if they are pretty simple. So I would say anything up to kind of like level two nested, so like a dictionary that has a dictionary as value, that's fine, but anything above that usually makes the code like really hard to understand for new people. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, one of the things I really like about Python, and I think it's universally loved, is readability. But when I saw your example of annotating the dunder init method, returning none, I thought, I hope I never have to review that. But if I understood you correctly, 
type checking will be disabled if we don't do that. Um, is there a style emerging of where we can say, please do not annotate absolutely everything so that we don't get to annotate every dunder in it with returning none, since it's by definition what it's going to return? You know, it's part of the language spec, isn't it? That's a, that's a very good point. Um, the counter argument to that one would be um, from the Zen of Python again, uh, explicit is better than implicit. So yes, uh, none is always returned implicitly from, from all Python functions if you don't have a return statement. But the typing uh, annotations went with the, the line of like making it more straightforward. So it is a tiny bit more verbose. I, I completely agree with it. Uh, but I don't think there was any discussion recently about getting rid of the none. Uh, for init functions, it might make sense because they're like very specific. But for other functions that are really like return nothing, I think it's still valuable to have that information there explicitly. Um, in terms of uh, typing everything, that's definitely not necessary, and it's sometimes even really hard. Um, things notably have like very hard, uh, um, hard time typing is things like database uh, access, like MySQL. When you do a uh, MySQL query against the database, you have no idea what you're going to get back. You know, it's again, you know, it's a list of dictionaries with string keys and any values. So like very little information there directly. So you do need to still do, either you just don't type them and use them as they are, or you invest significantly more time to uh, move them either to name tuples or to data classes, depending if you need mutability or not. But both, both approaches are valid. talk. Um, so I have a, it's a soft question, not a technical one, but it's perfectly related to what you're talking about. So um, the, it's along the lines of readability and just uh, overall test coverage and software engineering best practices. So um, you've probably found that um, Python being so easy to write and being used in the data science sphere, often you have people that don't necessarily have a, a strong software engineering background. So do you have any recommendations for teams that don't necessarily value continuous refactoring, improving readability and test coverage and so on? That's a, that's a very, very good point. I work with uh, data scientists on, uh, on a daily basis and I think there's a very big difference uh, if you're doing a notebook just to get a number out of it or a graph out of it, or if you're doing a notebook that you know someone else is gonna look at the code. Um, I would say if, if you know that someone else is going to review that code, then it's better to invest in the quality and readability. But I know that uh, on a day-to-day -day data science job, sometimes I just need uh, a single number uh, out of my data scientists, and they like do like 200 lines of notebook just to get me that number. But that code the next day is not, not needed anymore. So in that case, I completely understand that it does not have to be like the nicest thing ever. Okay, question over here. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is, um, we've run into issues before with circular impo um, imports where if we try and add the type annotation, and I was wondering how to deal with that. And then the second one is, if you've got a local variable in a simple-ish function, would you then skip the type checking if it's like a simple counter integer? Um, yeah. So for um, circular imports, that is a known, uh, a known issue that comes with, uh, with typing. Um, the way of solving it is by using the uh, type underscore checking variable uh, from the typing module, which is basically true only if you are type checking code. In production, it would be false. So you basically do if um, typing dot uh, type checking then you do the, circle, the imports that would cause a cycle, but then that runs only in type checking mode and the type checkers are aware of that problem and know how to fix it. So those imports runs only on type checking and not in production. That's, that's how you fix it. Um, sorry, what was the second question? If you have, uh, if it's a local variable in a, in a function, maybe just a counter, would you then also add a type to say it's an int? Or would you skip that? 
Uh, I would add the types only if the type checkers uh, ask me to add types. So as standard, I never type variables unless the type checker complains about it. It's not obvious from, from the context. That's the, the rule I use. OK, so we have time for one more question. If there is one, great. OK. I jingle when I run. Um, is this on? OK, cool. Great. Um, my question just has to do with uh, like the development of the type trackers and stuff that you've been using. Have you gotten any input from, I know there are teams in Facebook like Sigma which use Haskell and similarly uh, like structured languages. Have you had any input from those teams uh, in terms of exploring new kinds of types and ways of approaching this? Um, yes, uh, I'm not entirely sure how much of that is public knowledge, um, but <laughs> I think I can share that, for example, the, the team behind Pyre, which is our type checker, uh, some people uh, in there are the people that built HH, which is a type checker for, um, for Hack, and also I know they talked extensively to the people that built Flow, the type checker for JavaScript as well. So a lot of that knowledge was included in the very first design draft for, for our type checker. OK, well, that's it. I've got one last question. Um, on your protocol slide, you had some really fancy looking ducks. Are those, do those belong to you? Yes. <laughs> when did your pension for fancy ducks start happening? <laughs> I think I had like five now on my desk. Wow. We have the, that's quite an addiction. We have the, we have the thing at Facebook that uh, the way to notify other people not to bother you it's not just headphones, but also putting a duck on top of your, of, of your screen. It's kind of like a sign, do, do not dare to bother me, I'm doing important stuff. So do not bother me, I've got my pharaoh duck. Do they have like an importance order? Like really seriously, do not most bother people, me? Most people have only one, the five is, is my thing, I just like collecting them. <laughs> so I change them depending on the mood. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Well, thank you so much, Luca. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.